There's so little left of this tradition, this legacy in Bangor today. We have a Paul Bunyan statue and the Pierce Memorial and certainly the collections at the Bangor Historical Society, but other than that, you would never know today what Bangor's past was as, as the world's busiest lumber port. It just seems a little curious to me. Bangor's rise to prominence was slow in coming. It remained a frontier town well into the 19th century with few settlers venturing this far north. All that changed when the timber industry discovered the Penobscot River region. Few towns then rivaled Bangor when the logs came out of the woods and down the river in the springtime. When that came through, and it pretty much came through all at once, um, there'd be an enormous amount of activity going on, sorting the timber out, moving it down into the town, sawing it up. Um, so there'd be an overwhelming preponderance of men uh, on Exchange Street and uh, probably having a pretty good time um, having been up in the woods for say five, six months um, and completely isolated and at least in theory not having had a drink for that time. They would be looking out for having a very good time when they were in Bengal. So, so you would see a lot of mixing of uh, sailors and lumberjacks a lot of fights probably, and uh, a lot of very raucous behavior. This waterfront area of bars and upstairs brothels grew to become the notorious Hell's Half Acre. What you would smell, and I've heard this from several sources, is sawdust. Anywhere in town, that's the first clue that you're in a lumbering town, is you would smell the sawdust. And there would be boards and parts of boards and sawdust in the river. It's almost thick enough that you could walk across it. So all that stuff going into the river um, from the sawmills uh, would make it uh, both look and smell like a lumber town. The sounds, possibly you would hear some mills on the brewer side. There were some fairly big mills over there and down on the Hamden shore there were some, uh, some good sized mills down there. So you would hear that too above the sound of the uh, lumberjacks. Sitting on the largest river system entirely within Maine was vital for Bangor. For water, was at least as important as good timber. This is before the development of railroad logging. It's before roads were built into these interior regions and the rivers were the major, if not the only way, of getting trees out of the interior. In some cases, we're talking about trees that are maybe 400 miles deep into the interior. The harbor between Bangor and Brewer was just 50 miles from sea and very deep. During the busy season, it could accommodate up to a hundred vessels. It's been said that you could walk across the river on the decks of ships without getting your feet wet. Upstream of Bangor, the Penobscot's fast current powered dozens of sawmills in Old Town, Milford, and Orono. Lumber and wood products were rafted down to Bangor. Ships to carry the wood to markets were built at shipyards across the river in Brewer. The Maine provided the material basis of, of, of American culture, I think, in the in early 19th century, in the sense that just about everything that we used, everything that we lived in, everything that we carried things in was made of wood uh, in this period. This is sometimes called the age of wood. When, when virtually everything we now assume is made out of plastic or metal, aluminum, things like that, was made out of wood. A surprisingly high proportion of the lumber that went into building cities like New York and Boston, Philadelphia, came from Maine. Almost overnight, Bangor became a boom town. It grew rapidly in the 1830s and 40s, and fortunes were made. At one point late in the century, Bangor was said to be the richest city per capita in the world, prompting these comments from a visitor in 1835. The growth of Bangor has been truly astonishing, and judging from the past few years, its inhabitants form the most magnificent ideas of its future greatness and splendor. Ask a Bangorian if there is any reason to expect a continued growth of the city, similar to what it has experienced for the last few years, and he will declare that the lumber on the Penobscot waters is interminable.
But the good times don't last forever. Newly built railroads open up new stands of forests in Wisconsin, Minnesota, and the Northwest. What you see as the industry moved west is that the Bangor story repeats in, in New York, say Albany, New York, or in Burlington, Vermont, and then finally in the, at the mouth of the uh, Susquehanna River in Pennsylvania, and then in Saginaw, Michigan, for instance. It's the same story there and out of Coos Bay in, uh, in Oregon. Um, the boom town, then the bust after the boom, and uh, the story just repeats itself. It's amazing how, how similar these towns are. Bangor's reign as a lumbering capital is brief, little more than 40 years. The region scrambles to diversify and turns to making shoes and boots from tanned hides. Foundries and tool manufacturing fill another part of the void, as does shipping ice. Its location became an asset again as the area became an ideal link to down east summer resorts and inland sporting camps, as Bangor historian Bill Cook discovered. Uh, there were regular steamship lines between Bangor, Portland, Boston, and all up and down the East Coast. Again, that was in the 1870s, 80s, 90s, uh, about the same time as the railroads. So you get a lot of tourism. That's when you know, Bar Harbor started to blossom. Again, Bangor was sort of the jumping off point uh, to other points in Maine. Henry David Thoreau knew Bangor well, calling it a star on the edge of night. Thoreau used Bangor as his basis of operations when he came up here you know, and for his trips to the North Woods. Uh, almost every a trip to Mount Katahdin begins in Bangor. So Bangor was sort of the gateway to the North Woods for hiking, canoeing, hunting, fishing. As time went on, the area continued to find other ways to grow and prosper. But if you're looking for evidence of Boomtown Bangor, that's getting harder and harder to find. The devastating fire of 1911 had much to do with that. It was the worst disaster in the city's history. Because most of the city was made of wood, the fire spread rapidly from building to building. It even jumped the Kanduskeg stream. Fifty-five acres were charred, 267 buildings destroyed, and a hundred more damaged. Of course, everything in the downtown area pretty much was destroyed in 1911 with the big fire. Uh, so we don't really see much of what Bangor looked like before that. Up around the Bangor Theological Seminary, if you really look in, in a few narrow directions, you can almost see buildings that were original to Bangor and the, uh, the unique look to them. You can tell an older building in Bangor because the, the chimney is very, very high. And of course, that was made for the drafting because the higher the chimney, the better it drafts. If you really look, you can almost see the way it originally looked. And, and that's really all it is, is just an impression. If you get a real good imagination, you can, you can see it.